This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Good morning and aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea program. And today we have a topic that is interesting to me and the future of law. It's called Artificial Intelligence and the Practice of Law. And my guest is Priya R Rashid. Ms. Rashid is a Juris Doctoral Candidate class of 2018 at the University of Hawaii's William S. Richardson School of Law. As part of her studies, Ms. Rashid has developed an insight into the influence of artificial intelligence on the practice of law. And today we're going to talk about where that is now, where it's going, and what it means. What it means for the practice of law in the future. What it means right now, what do we have to learn. First, however, I want to ask Ms. Rashid, or Priya, may I call you Priya? Yes, of course. <laughs> Priya, why do you want to become a lawyer? What, uh, what, how did you get into that? Isn't there enough stress in life without uh, taking an occupation, a career that gives you more? Well, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me, Mark. You know, I'm a third year law student and I'm still answering that question. I came to law school because I loved to read and I loved to write. And they said, you know, there's a profession where that's literally all you do is read, write, and um, help problem solve. And so I'm still figuring that out. I have loved school so far and I've loved studying in Hawaii. And I have been exceptionally lucky to study international law and um, technological ethics and problem solving, so I've been extremely lucky. Okay, all right, so that's the real Priya. Now, artificial intelligence. What is, what is artificial intelligence? Give us a definition of that, please, and, and then I want to go into what it does to the law, or what's happening in the law today, but first tell me, put, put a face, if you will, on artificial intelligence, a real face. <laughs> well, that's, um, that's a mouthful, but artificial intelligence is the systems and the designs that um, essentially want to replicate and enhance human intelligence. And they generally require a high amount of human intelligence, um, such as visual perception, speech recognition, decision making. Anything that you've thought of as a smart computer probably has an aspect of artificial intelligence. And as we enter into an increasingly technological world, more things will have this smart intelligence, this human intelligence without the human. Hmm. Okay, now, you, you said it, it in, includes human intelligence, or it, it, that's part of it. Now, right, you, you, you said that artificial intelligence includes human intelligence, or uh, is, is, that, is that right? But does that, does that mean you have to be intelligent to, to watch it or get it, or, do you have, or does it mean that's how you create it? A little of both, maybe. As somebody that is not a tech-savvy person, I don't think you need a high level of intelligence or tech-savvy to appreciate artificial intelligence. I want that to you know, be okay. known. That That's good. Thank you. I think my, com my computer is very old. I think three years old, which is very old in the tech world. And my cell phone is five years old. So if that gives you any indication of my tech savvy, it's minimal. But it's important because if we talk about artificial intelligence, from the very beginning, um, in the 1950s, when artificial intelligence became a, a buzzword and something important, uh, it always was an imitation game to make it as human-like as possible. And we want our computers to be, that's what we aspire, is that humans um, are this special thing and computers enhance them. Okay, so, so the computer takes these traits and that's part of artificial intelligence and enhances them. Well, 
I would preface this with, hum um, excuse me, computers don't really do anything. Okay. Computers, we shouldn't anthropomorphize, we shouldn't give them human-like qualities or animal-like qualities because they're just still this thing in front of us. They don't and have a soul. They don't no. have uh, intent. And, yeah. and they don't have power unless we give it to them. I see. Uh, give it to them. And even I do it um, when I'm speaking <laughs> about computers. <laughs> so. Okay, so, so uh, computers, we know about computers, artificial intelligence, I'm getting a, a feel for it. it. It enhances the human qualities. And it's 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 something we can go online maybe and find out about. What is artificial intelligence and the practice of law? What's that about? You know. So to begin with, artificial intelligence and the practice of law is just like any other profession and any other area. And I joke around with people and I say. The first people that are going to get hit are the doctors, the truck drivers, and the lawyers, because it just shows how unspecial we are. And for us, the, um, the unique and special thing about our profession is that we're paid to think. We're paid to mm. problem solve. And so doing that accurately, doing that in a um, socially proper manner, those are things computers can't do. But having the right information, having you know the perfect processing for e-discovery, knowing um, that there are 30,000 cases that are applicable to this problem that your client is facing, it can be overwhelming, but it can also be extremely empowering to an attorney. So, so all right, how did it start? How did it begin? What, what, for artificial intelligence and the law, what were the beginnings of it, and, and, and how did attorneys begin to use artificial intelligence to their advantage and, I guess, to the disadvantage of opponents at times, you know? I, I guess that would be the logical non-computer conclusion that I would uh, uh, make. Well, I would say that as a profession, we have been extremely resilient and stubborn when it comes to integrating. Lawyers? Lawyers stubborn? <laughs> Never, no. But, you know, we actually should be surprised at how resilient we have been to automation and artificial intelligence. And to tell you the truth, we borrow so much technology and so many ideas from other areas of our lives. So, for example, the computer processing and the computer power that has emerged in the last 20 years, we are being given you know, extreme power. And instead of utilizing it early on in the 70s and 80s, we pretty much decided that we were going to use junior associates as our robots for these you know, massive due diligence projects and massive discovery projects when we could have been making initial investment into the technology. We chose as a profession because of how, you know, how um, special our client relationships are, how important the consequences were that these tasks belong to humans. And we made that decision early on. But now we're competing against the medical field and, um, for example, gene sequencing. These areas that require a lot of computer processing are now saying, how come the lawyers never use these computers? How come they aren't using these for these millions of cases around the world to problem solve? And we're looking at them without a very good answer because we could have saved clients a lot of money. We could have saved junior associates a lot of suffering, maybe, if we had started to automate and integrate artificial intelligence earlier. At the current um, state that we're at right now, all of the Magic Circle firms, all of the larger firms, over 400 people, have either started massively investing into artificial intelligence technology or have already integrated it into their due diligence, their discovery processes, and their major billable hours, their major income generating areas. And so it's pretty scary to think that maybe the small and mid-sized firms are threatened by a massive disruption in the legal field. And so that's where I'm interested in how do we protect these small and mid-sized firms you know, from this automation disruption. Okay, so who are, who are the magic firms? What are magic circle firms? What does that mean? So uh, that's a uh, colloquial phrase to um, reference these English, or, you know, these traditionally large mega firms. Um, they use Swiss Verein structures to have 
fran I should use this colloquially, franchises around the world. And essentially, they run the corporate structures and network, whether it's um, corporate contracting, arbitration, um, dispute and litigation, mediation, all of these large international law firms, private sense. international law. And they're the ones who are harnessing artificial and, intelligence. And when did this start? When did this start? I mean, I think that when it came to the control function on our keyboard and us realizing that in discovery, actually having it on a computer was faster than having the printout was when lawyers started realizing these big cardboard boxes were not going to be the future. And most of it was cheap. Most of it was what you could get on a Microsoft Word processor, so what was built in every single computer. And then they realized it wasn't specialized enough. And so in the late 90s, lawyers started realizing there are specialized tools. Um, for example, Dragon Dictation, which was commonly used by doctors. Lawyers said, why should I hire a paralegal to do my dictation when mm -hmm. I could? But now, with most attorneys being high-level typists, that also became a little bit of a fad. And so we've been trying to integrate these fads as quickly as possible and see what stays. But I, I sense from what you said earlier, there was a, initially kind of a reluctance uh, that we are, our profession uh, deals with other people and really you really need a human attorney. We can't, we can't send this out to a machine. But, but uh, that's changed because of the other professions have sort of spurred that on. It's what I hear you saying. Yes, and I think there were two factors to consider in the reason that has happened. One, we have a very insular profession. We mm. believe you know, in the client relationship. We are one of the few professions that we regulate ourselves. Um, we license ourselves, and that's a privilege, but it's also a great responsibility. And when it came to technology, we almost were a bit arrogant in saying that it wasn't going to be us. It was going to be the doctors and the truck drivers, but not us. Right. And well, that, you need me. And I think that that also happened to coincide with the increasing litigation costs and clients saying that you're not bringing the, um, the value that I need. And so, for example, several major contracts in the last 10 years um, in the United Kingdom, in Spain, in Italy, and also in the United States actually started saying, we refuse to pay in, in the contract. We refuse to pay for anything that could be done by a paralegal. We refuse to give billable hours to anything that could be done by a junior associate. And it started to um, make firms, large partners, think to themselves, well, why should I have a junior associate if I'm not going to be getting billable hours for them? And then it became another matter of how do you get the work done in the most efficient way? And a lot of the times the answer became computers for large firms who could overcome the cost barriers. So what I hear you saying, actually, is that it's all about money in a, in a way. In a, in a way that sort of started, especially with the international firms. And now we hear that the international firms are developing at full speed ahead, this artificial intelligence. And I'm gonna, we're going to take a break, but I want to ask you after the break, what are they doing with it? And what can the small firms do to compete? And then where, how far does artificial intelligence go? And you told us it doesn't have a soul. You, you, you intimated that. I, I said that. But can we blame it for anything? But let, let, let's take a break and then we'll, we'll ask those questions. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest. You can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door. You can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock, you can move a mountain, you can break rocks. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Pete McGuinness-Mark, and every Monday at 1 o'clock, I present Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa, where we bring together researchers from across the campus to describe a whole series of scientifically interesting topics of interest both to Hawaii and around the world. So hopefully you can join me 1 o'clock Monday afternoon for Think Tech Hawaii's Research in Manoa. Welcome back. I'm Mark Schklov, host of Think Tech Hawaii's Law Across the Sea. And my guest, Priya Rashid, and I are talking about artificial intelligence and the practice of law. And Priya, when we broke, we, you were talking about how large law firms are now getting into it. It just makes more sense from, from the bottom line, it appears. And, and at one time, the profession felt, well, you only have to deal with you have to deal with attorneys. Uh, that kind of sacrosanct feeling is kind of dissolved. What are the law firms doing? What, how, what are the basic uses of artificial intelligence with these large lo law firms, first of all? How are they being used? Well, so for example, most large law firms have started to integrate natural language processing and machine learning. And so that means um, intake, instead of having a paralegal or a junior associate, associate integrate um, clients, a machine might do it, and then this uh, secondary or tertiary step is a junior associate or a paralegal. So what, what does the machine do in that respect? So the machine actually tries to... Or, or is it, I'm sorry, do we call it a machine or artificial intelligence? I'm I sorry. mean, there are probably, I think, roughly about 20 or 30 mainstream systems, and systems is a great way to, okay. you know, a catch-all. Okay. And these systems try to read things such as um, word patterns. I'm worried about my divorce. Uh, we have been uh, fighting for eight months. There's been a crime committed, things like that, and try to almost problem solve, pre-problem solve, and give the lawyer a uh, time-saving tool. Like a summary or something? S a summary is just uh, a minimal issue, a top, a thing that can happen. But for example, it might actually begin, take the next step to say, this is the problem. This is the choice of forum. You know, this is the wow. forum of uh, where the case should be disputed. This is the probability of success, and this is the probability of cost. My gosh. Do you think that this client, and also the probability of, of payment sometimes, okay. which is really important for mid-sized and small <laughs> firms of client payment. So. Okay. What else besides that? Uh, well, I think that on the other side, so for small and mid-sized firms, many of them have already started integrating. Um, case law analysis, so for example, Bloomberg is a, pro a legal service provider, um, and they have started to do uh, case mapping. So making information much easier to uh, take in and absorb so that a lawyer can become faster and take on more clients. So things like that are common tools, common machine learning tools. And another example what I would use is for example, Legal Aid in Legal Aid Hawaii, um, they already have a chat box um, that was made this past year by another um, Richardson uh, candidate in my cohort. And what they did was they had a grant from Microsoft and AmeriCorps, and they actually gave them the funds to create an intake box, a chat box. And ironically, the student's name is Chad, so we call it the <laughs> chat box. But it's, if you think about legal aid as a smaller mid-sized firm, and they're extremely under-resourced, they're helping indigent populations and people that really need this service. They deserve that right. type of artificial yeah. intelligence and that automation so that they can help as many people as possible. So, so somebody would call up, describe their problem, and the s system would? The system would give them a range of possibilities. Um, so for example, when you go onto the legal aid site and you type in your problem, you might say, I have a landlord-tenant dispute, and I've been living there for four years, but I don't have a lease. The computer can pick up that it's going to be a matter of a, con of a non-written contract. You know, these big problems that happen when you do or don't have a contract. Okay. And the computer can guide the information in a certain way and kind of guide a conversation almost the way a human being would. Okay, and so 
the system, the computer, the machine will send, will take, do an analysis of some sort internally by, I guess, going through and finding out what words are in common, and then send something to an associate or attorney. Then what does the attorney do with that? Well, so for example, um, the attorney can triage the cases. What cases need to be responded to now versus this afternoon versus tomorrow morning, which is extremely important. Those types of decisions can create much greater efficiency. But also, like I told you about adding predictability and information to the client, that client can get information immediately, um, which lawyers have mixed feelings about. But in terms right. of right. the sure. legal profession and also society, there is really nothing wrong with people having information faster. And in fact, it's an indication of a good society when people can have the things they need, and whether that's comfort or information, um, as quickly as possible. And artificial intelligence through the legal field can provide that. Okay, so let me do a couple follow-ups here now. What's going to happen to these associates and these paralegals and these, uh, these secretaries, law secretaries and assistants? With, if, if something comes in, isn't that going to take jobs away? Or is it going to, are we, you know, what is technology doing here? What's going to happen? Well, fundamentally, if you think about what we do as humans, what do we enjoy doing? We enjoy problem solving. We enjoy uh, re client relationships generally. If you come to work and you can do something robotic and you click 30 times a day, there is a justification that a robot should maybe do your job for efficiency. But I don't believe that the members of the legal profession are likely to be impacted by immediate or um, unexpected suffering through unemployment. In fact, what I believe is I think that when I graduate, I'm going to get a job that I love much more than if I had to do 80-hour weeks of due diligence checks because I think that the partner will expect from me to be a better problem solver and a better critical thinker because that is the best investment into this associate. And so I do wonder if members of my class are going to be um, maladapted or ill-adapted to the new, new legal profession. But I also think that if you're a critical thinker, if you're a hard worker, and you bring something new to the table, every day you wake up with a creative mind um, and a, as a problem solver, I don't believe that your job will be as at risk as you might believe it to be. So I hear you saying, use the technology to advance your job, and it, you'll, you'll have a job, but you'll use the technology. The, job, the technology won't take your job away. You will use the, the technology to enhance your job. Is that, is that? Well, I think that in all professions, the theme of artificial intelligence is really that technology can enhance the things that make us human and special. And so, for example, Problem solving with a client is often limited because of the research, that it, the sheer amount of time it takes to research, draft memos, file briefs, and the high stakes require you know, strict scrutiny. But if you had a computer checking you, double checking you, how much time could you spend conversing with the client? How much time could you spend thinking of novel ideas in that brief? So those are the things that most lawyers enjoy and love, and those are the things that make us human. Okay, so uh, I got a couple follow-up things I want to ask you. First of all, do law firms charge for this time for the time of the computer? Do they? Is that a is that a billable hour? Does it? Do do these? You know, do we have a system that now goes on the bill uh, saying I am charging so much per hour for that? Is that how they do it? Or? I don't think that the um, model rules of ethics would let computers receive billable hours because it's just you know not the way of the world. But I also believe that there is a serious cost um, barrier to entering into artificial intelligence, and I do believe clients will feel it in um, their charges and in their um, cost layouts. But there may not be a world um, with billable hours in the next 20 years. It may be um, hmm. service-based fees, but not quite contingency fees. I think that it actually will make the legal profession have to reconsider 
why is it paying so much? Why is cost so high in litigation and things like that? And I think it'll bring the total price of legal services down. And I don't know if our salaries will actually go down. I don't think they will. So that actually is good for the market and good for um, efficiency. Okay, so will the small firms be able to compete still? They, they, I, I think I'm hearing you say that they can use this technology. It's, they're not gonna be um, bought out. They're, they, it's within the price range of, uh, of the smaller firms. Well, there is a cost, there are some cost barriers, but as we know, we have some of the highest numbers of solo practitioners in the country in per capita in Hawaii. I believe that it's up to each individual attorney, whether you're flexible um, and able to adapt to this new cost sharing scheme and using artificial intelligence is a very difficult question to answer, especially for um, you know individual individual attorneys. But I would say this, that it is an opportunity for small firms to leverage technology and go head to te head, to head with larger firms. And I do believe that for a, in a client perspective, you get the cost um, and you get the attention of a small firm. And if the technology is there, that means that the best quality is, that's the best of our profession. High quality, low cost. Okay, now, my last question for you, okay? What do we do to prepare for the future? What, what's, what's your advice and suggestions for lawyers to prepare for the future with artificial intelligence? Well, my conclusion and advice, personal advice, is that you should consider this a positive thing, a good thing, because it is inevitable. <laughs> and I truly believe that the greater um, flexibility any person has, but especially a lawyer, it'll only make you a better problem solver and a better um, service provider for your client if you can be flexible, if you look and know about the tools that are available to you so you can be a better, um, a better tool for your client. And so, like I said, accept it, embrace it, maybe internalize it and think to yourself, this is a new place that I'm going to be successful in. And also continue to be a human, a real person. In light of the artificial intelligence, still can maintain your strengths as a person. Yes, exactly. I think that when we practice law, we should harness the things that make us special, our ability to interpret political, moral, social constructs, whether something's good, you know, whether something can be done versus whether it should be done, that's where we can be true stewards of this artificial intelligence movement as lawyers for corporations, for governments, that's what lawyers are meant to do. And then hopefully we'll have more time because of artificial intelligence to go home and hug our children and be with our families. Mm. Mm. That's very nice, very nice thought. Thank you, Priya, Priya Rashid. Thank you very much for being my guest today. <laughs> You're welcome, Mark. Aloha. Thank you.